Hello and welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending where you are. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sherzad Muminov. I am Associate Professor of Japanese History at the School of History of the University of East Anglia in Norwich, UK. I am also Acting Director of the Center for Japanese Studies and a convener of a research webinar series. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all uh, for our last seminar, webinar of this semester. And our speaker today is joining us from Tokyo, uh, I believe, where the time is 10 p.m. So thank you, Gunde, for joining us at such a late time. Um, and the topic of Gunde's presentation is Transcultural Dynamics in Memory Literature of Japanese and Lithuanian-speaking Prisoners of War and Political Prisoners in the Soviet Union. Uh, that is a topic close to my heart, uh, very related to my own research. Um, but as you know, if you follow this seminar series, we have a, a very wide range of speakers, different disciplines. This seminar and webinar series is, is interdisciplinary. So we have an exciting lineup of uh, um, seminars and events for the coming spring semester, which we will announce in the near future. So please join those two. Um, so let me briefly introduce our today's speaker. Kunde Dokshete is a doctoral candidate at the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies graduate program researching transcultural dynamics in memory literature about the imprisonment in the Soviet Union. As you can probably tell, this relates directly to today's talk. So uh, Gunde received her BA in Japanese studies from Sheffield University with a thesis on Japanese women authors in English translation. She received her master's degree after completing the joint degree program in transcultural studies at Heidelberg and the Graduate School of Letters at Kyoto University. Her MA thesis was about anarchism in Japan, based on an, on an analysis, excuse me, of Osawa Masamichi's writings. In between her master's and doctoral studies, she worked at the Embassy of the Republic of Lithuania in, to Japan in Tokyo, and at Vilnius University Press in Lithuania. Uh, before I give the floor to Gunde, can I please remind you that uh, if you have questions during the talk, um, please feel free even during the talk to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the page to type in your question. <clears throat> and of course, feel free also to do that after the talk finishes. Um, and uh, I will read those questions out to the presenter. So without further ado, Gunde, the floor is yours. And thank you very much. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, I had a self introduction with the math as well. We can leave that aside since I've already done. So, uh, the title that you can see to this presentation is also the title of my uh, doctoral thesis. As I've submitted it to the paperwork, so I'm kind of stuck with it, even though it's not very catchy. Um, but I'm kind of keeping it for the presentations as well, because um, I think, as you can see from this title, we can I I'm taking several subjects that are usually, I think, seen and studied in isolation and connecting them into one project. Uh, so I'm going to start this presentation by introducing these separate subjects uh, from the title first, and then show how they connect in my thesis. I'll start with the mechanisms of internment and repression in the Soviet Union in general. Uh, then I'll talk about the Japanese prisoners of war and subsequently about Lithuanian political prisoners in the Soviet Union. I do this because I do not want to assume that everyone in the audience is knowledgeable about all three. Uh, since this is organized by the Center for Japanese Studies, I think most of you have at least heard about the Japanese POWs in the Soviet Union. But as you probably know, it is anything but the hottest topic in the field of Japanese studies. I can tell you from my experience that uh, when I was an undergraduate in, Sheff in Sheffield in Japanese studies, the subject did not come up at all. And I only learned about this sort of accidentally while writing my master's thesis about 
anarchism in Japan, which is completely unrelated, mostly sort of unrelated. Uh, similarly, the history of the Soviet Union, let alone Lithuania, and that will known outside of Eastern Europe, I think. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the three subjects and fields of study which are in general seen as somewhat separate from one another, although they very clearly overlap. I mean, think of this as a literature view or the current state of research. But I'm going to shift gears from historical overview to more theoretical stuff and introduce the idea of transcultural dynamics or transculturation as I've inherited it at Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies. And I'm going to show how it can be used or more specifically how I'm using it to connect the three fields I mentioned before. Technically speaking, this is the theory and hypothesis section of my presentation. Uh, then I will talk about my sources and methods of working with those sources. And finally, I will talk about my preliminary results, uh, which I think is the most exciting part. Uh, so I'm going to start, as I said, with a very brief historical background of internment and political aggression in the Soviet Union. It might feel like forever, but I promise it's only going to take five minutes. I'm going to keep it very simple and brief. So in the interest of time and sanity, uh, let's reduce the system of punishment in the Soviet Union to three main components, prisons, camps, and forced settlements. Uh, prisons were for short-term domestic offenders and for transitioning to camps, so they are not quite relevant to my analysis. Let's put them aside and move on to camps. Most of you have probably uh, heard the word gulag before. It's an acronym that stands for the Central Administration of Camps in Russian, uh, but has become a general term for forced camps and settlements in the Soviet Union. Uh, historians trace the beginning of the Gulag as a camp system to 1923, when uh, the Solovki prison camp was set up on the Soviet islands, the prisoners of which were used for building the White Sea Baltic Canal. Uh, you can see both the island and the canal on the map here. It was far away from the urban centers, and uh, the prisoners were used for labor, which we may say are the main defining features of imprisonment camps in the USSR, although there are obviously deviations. So the Slavki was the model for other camps across the Union, which then in turn were a model for the POW camps, which were set up later in 1939 and managed by a separate administrative body called Gukvi, the chief administration of the POWs and internees. Regardless, uh, the women's camps, special camps, POW camps, and all the other camps, there were many different types, were modeled after the same thing. So the people in them had somewhat similar experiences. They were displaced and forced to work, with some exceptions. Uh, the same two conditions, displacement and labor, also apply to another form of punishment I mentioned earlier, population transfers, which are also called forced resettlements or deportations or domestic exile. So again, people who experienced deportation also had somewhat similar experiences to those in camps. They were far away from home, their freedom of movement was restricted, although to a lesser degree, and they were forced to work. I'm highlighting uh, similarities over differences here for a reason, which I think will become obvious in my theoretical part when I get to it in a bit. Uh, now, on top of the three types of punishment that I mentioned earlier, let's sketch out four types of the punished. Prisoners of war, criminal prisoners, political prisoners, and deportees. Prisoners of war sounds self-explanatory, but as always, when it comes to the history of the Soviet Union, there are some caveats. Uh, especially when talking about the Japanese POWs. Uh, I will get back to that in a bit. Go along, along the list, criminal prisoners were people convicted of general criminal activity, like murder or theft or petty crimes. They were almost always the majority in the general camps and had a high turnover because they would get relatively short sentences, up to five years, and would be uh, released relatively soon. It should be noted, though, that people were often convict convicted of things that we do not consider crimes today, like being late for work or taking a pencil from your office. Uh, both are examples given by Anne Applebaum. But there was also a group of so-called professional criminals who were a constant source of pain and trouble for other uh, prisoners, especially those convicted of the so-called political crimes. 
according to memoirs, these professional criminals often had a better relationship with the camp authorities or used coercion, so they would get better jobs, better food, but add better treatment in general, which would be a deciding factor between life and death. Now, most of these descriptions of the professional criminals come from people who were themselves the so-called political prisoners. Uh, the name suggests that these would be people who tried to start a coup, who spread anti-Soviet propaganda, or at least criticized the government in some way. In reality, this was an extremely diverse group, just like the so-called criminal prisoners. To put it briefly, and at the risk of uh, oversimplifying, these were people convicted of counter-revolutionary crimes under Article 58 of the Criminal Code. Uh, the article punished any anti-Soviet activity and, importantly, after revision in 1934, any intent of anti-Soviet activity, as Alexander Solzhenitsyn has successfully put it. So from then on, effectively, anyone could be arrested. All that was needed in terms of the legal system was a perceived intent of counter-revolutionary activity. And it could have been perceived uh, by anyone, the secret police, your co-workers, your neighbors, or your children. So what's important to remember about the category of political prisoners is that these are mostly people who committed minor offenses or just got on the wrong side of somebody willing to inform on them or were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, like the Soviet Union in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, these were mostly not the Alexei Navalny type hardcore critics of the government. This does not mean that all political prisoners were innocent victims of the regime. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. There were obviously all kinds of people there. Uh, but I do want to highlight the ambiguity of this category. As again, Anne Appelman has put it, criminals were not always people who had committed real crime, and it was even rare for a political to have committed a political offense. The fourth group of the Spanish that I mentioned earlier were the deputies. Uh, these were the family members of political prisoners, groups of ethnic minorities who came under years of Stalin's suspicion, sometimes uh, collapsed. The, the wealthy peasants would be deported rather than sent to the camps, or again, just someone who was at the wrong place at the wrong time and was swept up in the wave of mass arrests and deportations. Um, the fact that all types of prisoners and deputies were used for labor meant that they were concentrated in particular areas that required labor force, such as places where natural resources could be extracted or certain infrastructure had to be built. So if you look at this map, you can see that camps were concentrated where labor force was required, and the same could be said about forced resettlement. So even though we're talking about many types of camps, including the POW camps and resettlements, and many types of prisoners and punished, they were concentrated in certain areas. What is important for my project here is that what the Soviet government did is essentially take people from as far as it could reach, from Finland, Poland, Germany in the West, to Central Asian countries in the South, to Japan in the East, and put them to live and labor in these areas that could essentially be called contact zones, uh, following Maria Louise Pratt's definition. Scholars have called it the Tower of Babel demographic complexity, and survivors of the camps have called it a cultural melting pot. The Japanese side of the story, which is often told completely separately from the larger history of camps that I just told you, is that on August 9th, 1945, the Red Army of the Soviet Union attacked the Japanese Imperial Army stationed in Northeast China and Korea, uh, breaking the Soviet Japanese neutrality pact that they signed in 1941. Different parts of the quantum army resisted for different amounts of time, but by September 2nd, the hostilities were largely over, and the quantum army ended up in the custody of the Red Army. In the beginning, the plan was to repatriate them, uh, but there's a Stalin, the de facto ruler, Soviet Union ordered half a million strong and healthy Japanese to be transported to the Soviet territory and put to work, allegedly to replace the Soviet workforce that was decimated during the Second World War. So there were no preparations or infrastructure in place to transport this many people from Manchuria to the Soviet Union. Uh, some rounding errors were also made in the chaos, so they transported more than half a million. Uh, the estimates go as high up as 100,000, but uh, around 600,000 is the most cited figure. Uh, these were mostly the quantum soldiers, but there was also other military personnel like doctors, nurses, uh, government 
So I have like intelligence officers and so on. There are also some civilians, especially from the southern uh, Sahelin, which now became Soviet territory. As you can imagine, the majority were uh, Japanese, but there were also significant numbers of Chinese and Koreans, as well as smaller numbers of other nationalities who were in the Panzan army or somehow affiliated with it. So even though we're talking about Japanese prisoners of war, they were moved to the Soviet territory after the war was officially over. They were not only military personnel, and they were not only Japanese. Uh, there's always in the Soviet Union were controlled by a separate administrative body, as I mentioned, but that does not mean that they were completely separated from other prisoners or the civilian population. Some were, but many also encountered field numbers from of other nationalities like Germans and Hungarians. Many also worked in those large resource extraction and industrial projects that I showed earlier, where they encountered everybody else uh, working there other types of prisoners, the deportees from all of the Soviet Union, and the locals, uh, the uh, Russians, the Saxons, and so on. Some of the so-called war criminals were sentenced under the same Article 58 that I mentioned of the Soviet criminal code, and they ended up in the general camps managed by the Gulag rather than the Kupi. Uh, by 1946, they already started repatriating the Japanese back to Japan, and by 1950, the Soviet side declared that all the POWs have been returned and the several thousand who still remain in the Soviet Union are war criminals who will remain imprisoned uh, for the war crimes. Stalin died in 1953, which uh, allowed the regime to temporarily soften somewhat. And by 1956, all those Japanese prisoners who wanted to go back to Japan have allegedly been repatriated, although some remained in the USSR willingly. Uh, for those who returned, this was unfortunately not uh, the end of their hardships because many faced discrimination in Japan due to suspicions of Soviet espionage and uh, communist affiliation, as well as health issues brought on by years of hard labor in bad conditions. Moving on to the Lithuanian part of the story, which again is still completely separately from the Japanese part and somewhat independently of the general Soviet history, the Soviet military first entered the then somewhat newly established independent Lithuania in 1940 and started arrests and deportations in the same year. Some 30,000 people were arrested and deported before the oncoming German army pushed the Red Army out in 1941 and started sending people to uh, the bone camps. By January of 1945, the Soviet army was in control of the whole territory again, and the Lithuanian Socialist Soviet Republic was re-established. The deportations and arrests uh, started again right away in 1945. The estimates are about 332,000 people arrested, sent to camps, and deported altogether from 1940 until 1958, with about uh, 150,000 ending up in the camps. Among these were also the Poles, the Jews, and other Lithuanian minorities. Most of these people had sentences that they had to spend either in camp or in the settlement that they were deported to, but after the sentence was uh, served, they were not allowed to return to Lithuania as part of their punishments. Uh, some came back illegally. Others settled wherever they could, sometimes close to the places where they were imprisoned or deported to. Things uh, changed by 1956 when major amnesties allowed former prisoners and deportees to return to their places of origin, but neither the Soviet Lithuanian government nor the Lithuanian society were welcoming these people at the time. So, similarly to the Japanese POWs, their hardships did not uh, really end upon release or returning home. I want to highlight here that the categories that I use in my title, Japanese prisoners of war and Lithuanian political prisoners, aren't by any means uh, straightforward. The history of the Japanese POWs in the Soviet Union also involves Chinese and Koreans who were captured, and it involves civilians and government staff. The history of Lithuanian political prisoners also involves the Polish and the Jewish parts of the population, as well as the deportees. Um, most importantly, I want to show how diverse Soviet places of imprisonment and forced labor were 
They showcase the diversity of the whole Soviet Union and everything that was bordering it in a highly concentrated and restricted space of camps. Uh, this brings me to the theoretical part of my project, which is based on the idea of transculturation. Uh, the main principle behind it is that culture, if we take it very broadly to mean the ways of life and thought, is a process rather than a thing, and it is born out of contact. Uh, what we see as culture, be it certain practices, objects, or ideas, uh, comes from processes of borrowing, assimilation, copying, as well as resistance, withdrawal, and rejection, among other things. These processes are a product of contact and interaction between entities that perceive each other as different. Uh, these could be nations as we understand them today, or highland societies vis-a-vis -vis lowland societies, or nomads and settlers, and all the other diverse and creative ways in which people have been categorizing themselves. Another way to put this is that at the very core of the process we call culture is transculturation. Now, the definition of culture that I started out with is so broad, it basically covers everything human-related, but it does not mean that the theory of transculturation can explain everything human or cultural. Uh, there are two main prerequisites for it to be applied fruitfully. First, the entities that come into contact need to be somehow transformed by that encounter. And second, something new needs to be born out of this encounter that is not completely of either of the entities. A classic example would be Fernando Ortiz's study of Cuba, where he demonstrates how the contact and interaction between the natives, the Africans, the Spanish, and the Americans produce Cuban culture, which is not just a hybrid of all those influences, but something genuinely new. Since Ortiz wrote that in 1940, a few important aspects have been added to this idea that differentiates it from ideas like hybridization, assimilation, internationalism, and so on. Uh, first, as I mentioned, that the interaction is transformative to everyone involved. Second, that it can involve not just harmonious mixing and adaptation, but also negative dynamics uh, like rejection and refusal and reinforcement of difference which can in their own right be transformative to the parties involved and produce something new. My hypothesis is that transculturation happened in and around the Soviet camps and it is reflected in camp memoirs. As I hopefully shown in my brief historical overview, the conditions for contact and interaction were there. This does not mean that every individual in the camps had a culturally transformative experience my focus is not on individuals, but rather a broader view on what kinds of exchanges took place, how difference was negotiated, overcome, or re-established, and what kinds of interactions uh, happened according to memoirs. The issue with this is that the process of culture is usually invisible to the people involved in it. So there are no official government reports or individual memoirs about transculturation. What I often have to look for are the blind spots, hints, accidental mentions, and silences. This brings me to my sources, uh, the bulk of which are memoirs. Uh, my main focus is on memoirs that I can read in the original language, which would be those written in Japanese and Lithuanian and a handful that were originally written in English or German. I'm also determined to include some memoirs that were originally uh, written in other languages that have been translated into something that I can read. In 1976, it was estimated that there are about 2,000 published memoirs on the Japanese side, although there's definitely more now, I think. And in 2003, the estimated 500 books and booklets on the Lithuanian side. For the Lithuanian side, the majority of the 500 books were published from 1989 onwards, during the height of the independence movement at a time when the Soviet Union was about to dissolve, and right after it had dissolved. Uh, the former prisoners and deputies couldn't openly publish their memoirs before then uh, because of Soviet censorship. But people writing in the 90s we're often very concerned with projecting an image of solidarity among Lithuanians 
in the camps and resistance to the Soviet government uh, from the get-go. A splendid example that illustrates this is a double testimony of the Legan Kimichuta, who was deported when she was a teenager. She ran away from the Federation, returned to Lithuania illegally, and during that brief period, she wrote down her memories from the Federation and buried the notebook. She was then captured and sent to the camps for several years, but she came back uh, to Lithuania in 1957, but could not find her earlier memoirs, so she started working on a new one. She published it in Russian in Semizdat, the underground press, First, and later a friend helped her translate it into Lithuanian. This second memoir was published posthumously in 1988, and it was, uh, in fact, the very first officially published Lithuanian memoir about the Federation, which allegedly started an avalanche of testimonial literature about Soviet oppressions, and at the time, still Soviet Lithuanian. But uh, here comes the most interesting part. Her earlier memoir, which she wrote sometime in 1949, 1950, and couldn't find later was discovered and published in the 1990s. It caused quite a stir in Lithuania at the time because her earlier memoir was lacking in exactly the type of overhyped Lithuanian solidarity that was so prevalent in more or less all the memoirs published from the 1989 onwards, including her own later memoir. So those later texts fit the memory national identity paradigm quite perfectly. So much in them is about expressing belonging to a nation which has experienced something together and less about the day-to-day -day of the camps. Therefore, I'm much more interested in uh, earlier memoirs that were published abroad. So far, I have found seven, uh, most of them published in the US, but also in West Germany and the UK. I hope to find more in the future, uh, potentially by establishing connections with diaspora communities that still exist today. They might have within the memoirs that were smuggled out or written by SPPs and that were only published in small runs or simply collected and not published at all. Uh, this is a small lead that still needs to be pursued to see if I can find anything that hasn't been collected by the National Library in Lithuania. Uh, regardless, I will be including some of the later memoirs as well because it is possible, I think, to find something more than nationalism and Russophobia in them. Uh, the case of Japanese memoirs about internment in the Soviet Union is quite uh, different because some people were publishing their memoirs as soon as they were back in Japan. Memoir books were already coming out in 1947, uh, while the majority of prisoners were still in the Soviet Union, and they keep coming out after the present day. A collection of interviews with women internees came out as recently as 2019. Uh, this means that there, were, there are a lot of tropes uh, that have solidified over the years and become an almost necessary part of every memoir about the Soviet Union. So, same as with Lithuanian memoirs, I'm most interested in stuff that was published the earliest, which brings me to the POW debriefing reports. An important difference between Japanese and Lithuanian former prisoners is that in Japan, people who were coming back on ships from the Soviet Union had the opportunity to immediately write a short report for the government about their experiences in the Soviet Union. Uh, they were required to provide the details like the name, military affiliation, place of birth, and so on, but they could also voluntarily write a semi free form report. At the beginning, uh, several tens of them did so, but the later ships have hundreds of reports with every coming ship. Uh, these reports are the earliest source of information by the Japanese for the W's from the Soviet camps. I've only had a brief look at these reports for now because I've uh, been in Tokyo and I'm in Kyoto, but if we compare them to the memoirs from the 1990s, there are a few uh, interesting differences, I think. First, there are quite a few reports by converted communists uh, who state they're going to join the Communist Party of Japan and help bring about the revolution. Uh, that is completely gone from the memoirs in the 90s. Uh, nobody's talking about the revolution anymore or anything too politically or ideologically charged. Uh, second, the early reports were much more openly negative about the Soviet Union. Uh, by the 1990s, as most of these people were quite old, they were 
more likely to remember the time in the Soviet Union, sort of nostalgia and be much more politically correct. Uh, as an example, in the 90s, they're saying we were too hungry and tired to have any sexual thoughts or desires towards the local women. And in the early reports, they're saying that Soviet women were ugly and behaved like animals, implying that this is why there was no mingling. Uh, although there was, but uh, not for everybody. Similarly, there's more uh, judgment about the immora immorality of the Soviet people uh, who are allegedly frolicking about the open daylight. Uh, there's less of that in later memoirs. Uh, but the most important difference between the debriefing reports and the memoirs is the aspect of memory tropes. Uh, one of the cornerstone, cornerstone ideas behind memory studies is that individual memory is malleable by the collective memory uh, and the desire to belong. To use Pietro Buchholz's example, when people in Japan write or retell their memories of August 15, 1945 and the Emperor's de declaration of surrender on the radio, almost everyone mentions the extremely sunny weather. Uh, that was true of some parts of mainland Japan, but not the whole empire. Regardless, this trope has become so established that it features memoirs by people who were in all sorts of places in the empire. Uh, why do people express something that is not necessarily true in their memories? One reason is the symbolic power of this imagery, extreme light following the dark years of the war. And second reason is allegedly the desire to belong to a group which experienced history together. If you deviate too much uh, from the public narrative, were you even there? Uh, that is not necessarily to say that people lie in their summits, but that memory is fickle, and this has been a well known phenomenon in memory studies. Now, with these reports, I have an arguably unique opportunity to see how people remember their internment before it solidified into several recognizable themes. People writing these reports have not read or heard any memoir by other Japanese people who have experienced the same thing as them. Uh, they might discuss their experiences in the camps or while coming back on ships, they might be writing these reports in groups, uh, consulting each other, but there's nothing like the solidified tropes that are so abundant by the 1990s. Uh, that is not to say that the later memoirs are useless, but as with all memoirs, you need to read a lot to identify the different collective memory themes and then hope that you can see something new once you sit uh, through them. So there are thousands of memoirs and reports by the Japanese POWs about the Soviet camps, and I couldn't read them all in a lifetime. Regarding the reports, I will use uh, the titles because they have titles to decide which ones are relevant and will focus on the decipherable ones. Uh, since these reports are handwritten, there are just definitely some that are just uh, indecipherable. Uh, it's a shame, but also perhaps a lesson for the rest of us that if you want to leave something for posterity, um, work on your handwriting or type it up. As for how to limit the number of memoirs, since the beginning, what I've been most interested in were the texts that were published the earliest and were written by people who were in the camps the longest, because in theory, these should have fewer solidified memory tropes and spending longer time in the camps provides more opportunities for the type of dynamics that I'm looking for. But uh, for the two years that I've been working on this independently and in the pandemic conflicts outside of Japan, uh, I've only had access to memoirs from the 1990s onwards. So all my pre preliminary results, my whole project was premised on what I found in those quite late primary sources by people who were imprisoned for as little as one year to as much as a decade and everything in between. This made me realize that I can find transcultural dynamics in later memoirs and written by people who were imprisoned for a shorter time. So my current plan is to include the hundred or so short memoirs from the 90s because I already worked with these extensively. Then I hope to include a fair chunk of those reports uh, that I mentioned focusing on the later ones written by long-term prisoners. And I'm also bound to include some of the more popular older memoirs, like uh, the one by Ishihara Yoshiro or Takasu Ichiro. There's already a book about them in English, but they are exactly what I was hoping to work for. Uh, 
to work with from the start. And they have the stuff I'm looking for. So I'm hoping to feed them to some extent too. In terms of methodology, I have been influenced by literary studies because that is where camp memoirs have been analyzed and dissected the most systematically, I think. The way literary studies, um, more specifically Leona Toker in Return from the Archipelago, deals with these is they read large corpus and identify recurring themes, or top right in Toker's case. In that way, it is sort of similar to memory studies. Uh, that are also concerned with large current themes. Uh, there are also obviously capital studies in both memory and literary studies that deal with individual works, but that is uh, less relevant to my project because I will be dealing with a large body of literature. I have used a similar approach and tried to identify the current themes that hint at transculturation specifically. I should uh, say at this point, that I'm not doing an overview of camp memoirs from the Soviet Union. I'm looking for specific themes within a multilingual corpus. And my conclusions are not going to be about this literature at large, but about representation of transculturation in this published literature and other first-hand accounts. So far, I've identified several recurring, recurring motifs, which have grouped into four larger themes. You can see some of them here, although this is uh, not a comprehensive list. As with any graph or table, this is a uh, simplification. These uh, larger themes overlap, and some of the things I find don't neatly fit, or they could be put into several categories and so on. But it still helps to make sense of things, I think. Uh, some of these occur more often in Japanese memoirs, like descriptions of kindness from Russians. Others appear more often in Lithuanian memoirs, like descriptions of poverty in the Russian part of the USSR. But more importantly, all of these appear in both languages. Uh, I should also, I think, point out, though, that I'm not doing a strictly comparative study between Japanese and Lithuanian memoirs. I'm approaching memory literature about Soviet camps as one multilingual body of literature. There are obviously some important differences in content, for example, Memoirs written in Japanese generally tend to start with the last days of the war in Manchuria, and they always have some part of the text dedicated to the Soviet socialist re-education campaign uh, that was mandatory for the POWs. That is missing from memoirs by other types of prisoners than POWs and from DPRT memoirs. However, memoirs in all languages describe extreme weather, hunger, and hard labor. Not only do they have these large overlapping themes, they also have segments that mirror each other. For example, in Lithuanian memoirs, you find passages like, we were put in trains that moved eastward and eastward. While in Japanese memoirs, they write, we were put in trains going westward and westward. And the same kind of implied tragic tone of being moved away from one's homeland, uh, but from the opposite direction, directions. They also have segments that are almost identical. Uh, for instance, you can find identical stories about how prisoners on long train journeys were given their salty fish to eat and then deprived of water for a certain amount of time. And it is mind blowing to me that you can find identical stories in books written in different languages, decades apart, that have never been translated into one another. The idea is fundamental to memory studies about how individuals draw upon collective, nine times out of 10 national memory in order to retell their personal experiences are just insufficient to explain this. It is possible to explain some of it with Russian memoirs like Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago that circulated in Lithuania and Japan, translated or not, planting some ideas about the collective memory of camps. But this explanation still transcends national and divisive borders and it cannot explain every time this happens in memoirs in different languages. Uh, before wrapping up, I do want to show some examples uh, because I think that's kind of the most interesting and exciting part. Uh, this will be very few, very short experts, excerpts. Uh, the first one is from a short memoir story by Nandu Masa, published in 1995. Uh, he writes, for Chinese, the doctor started talking as he was coming closer. 
I'm Japanese. Is that so, Japanese? By the looks, you're no different from Chinese. Can you speak Russian? I can speak the everyday language. That's good. This year, there were a lot of Asian patients, but I was at loss as I couldn't talk to them. Are you a Soviet doctor? No, I'm Lithuanian. I was arrested while studying at a medical university in Moscow. The doctor smiled bitterly after saying this. I got an impulse to ask him why he was arrested, but decided not to question him further. Judging from his face, the doctor did not want to talk anymore either. And here is a scene from a memoir by Rosa Sharka published in 1993. A few thousand Japanese prisoners of war arrived the next day. For the first time in our lives, we saw so many Japanese who were in many ways different from Germans. The majority were small in stature, with glasses and metal teeth. Sullen, quiet, fallen in spirit. They would never start a conversation and then ask something, they would give a short answer and then fall silent. Again. The majority knew German. There were few who knew Russian. They were given 1,200 grams of bread each, a portion given to Stakhanovites, especially distinguished from how they were. However, only a few of them ate more than 200 grams per day. The bread started to get moldy and pile up, although we would come to help lessen those piles. Now it was clear to us why the whole criminal element was sifted away. It seems the camp administration did not want to show them, the Japanese, their true Stalinist camp, where thieves, bandits, and murderers had the power in their hands and were in a privileged position too. In terms of themes and motifs, these would obviously fall under the broad theme of contact, but there are also motifs of stereotyping, uh, maladaptation, in terms of the bread and some sort of exchange since the Japanese prisoners allegedly shared their bread rations. Uh, these are just two examples of specifically contact between Japanese and Italians, but there are a lot of instances of other types of contact, adaptation, conflict, and so on. Uh, here's another example from a memoir by a Lithuanian political prisoner who was a school teacher before he was arrested. Like the Uriki, professional criminals, the murderers are risk averse. They much prefer to choose victims who do not resist. They avoid conflict with those who are willing to fight back. They cannot know whether they would have to face a karate master or a jiu-jitsu expert. The feeble Japanese prisoners have taught many a hero lesson, even with a knife in their hand. And a few pages later, he writes, the Urki could be fought. All it took was courage and skill. Unfortunately, many Lithuanians lacked on that. The pre-war school system and the uncritical inculcation of the Catholic faith, full of humility and submission to God's will, were to blame. It was only in prison and during the prison transfer that I realized the mistakes that I had made in my teaching practice. All decent young people had to be taught karate and jiu-jitsu. Later on, he philosophized about how small nations should be allowed to exist on big nations. So he draws a parallel between the feeble Japanese prisoners who had to defend themselves against the murderers in the camp and the feeble nation of Lithuania, which has to defend itself against the murderers of uh, Soviet Russia. In other words, at least according to his memoirs, the encounter that the narrative had with the Japanese prisoners in the camps had an effect on how he thinks his own nation should change. So the cultural differences and separation are not dissolved in some sort of melting pot, but the contact has some sort of transformative effect. Uh, another excellent example, I think, is from Takaski Shur's memoir, and this is the last one. Uh, he worked as a translator in his camp and was asked to translate a Russian propaganda film to other Japanese PWs. Uh, he writes, we have to explain it to everyone. Hearing this, I was flabbergasted. My Russian was not worthy of the name Russian. It was a Japanese-style Siberian language, so to speak, which I learned mainly in Siberia. I thought the Japanese-style Siberian language, Nihonshiki um, Shvederbo, was an excellent example of a sort of adaptation in terms of the four themes I mentioned earlier. It shows a significant amount of awareness on the narrator's part that he is mixing different parts of his knowledge, experience, and the main identity. And the final product is not just the Russian language, it's the language of the camps spoken by the Japanese man. So these are the breadcrumbs uh, that I'm gathering to show that 
Soviet camp culture, which is the thing described by historians and other scholars working on Soviet camps, was a process of transculturation, at least as it is represented in camp memoirs. Since I'm working with memory, I can't say that this is how the camps were, but I can say that this is how they are remembered and represented at least in part. Um, to conclude, the memory of Soviet camps does not happen in isolation. Processes of commemoration that are taking place today in Japan, Lithuania, and anywhere else are products of, border, of, of broader processes of borrowing, copying, and rejection that transcend national borders and cultural divisions. But more importantly, what I'm trying to show with my project is that it's not just the processes of commemoration, but the very contents of remembrance are marked by contact and exchange. People writing their memoirs about the camps 40 years later, allegedly trying to, to express their belonging to a nationally defined group of suffering, felt compelled to include stories of alienation inside their group, contact with people outside of their group, and other stories that have nothing to do with national identity as we understand it today. If we move beyond the memory national identity paradigm and the methodological nationalism, we may just start to uncover the full complexity of sort of camp history and memory, and um, we start building new differentiated solidarities instead of competing in different for the Olympics. Thank you, that is everything. Thank you very much, Gunde, for a very stimulating talk. And I would like to encourage our audience members to ask questions. I certainly have quite a few questions myself, but uh, <clears throat> I will uh, first read uh, the question that we received in the Q&A from Professor Watanabe Toshio. So um, he's writing, Jan Asman's phrase, Erinnern um dazu de hören. I don't know, my German is probably not very good, but I, I know, I'm, I'm sure you know the phrase very well. Is actually, in order to belong, one has to remember. In that sense, I think it is stronger than it conveys togetherness and would support your argument better. My point is that the togetherness is not just referring to the past, but the present as well. So that is, it's uh, more of a comment, I think, than a question. So feel free to respond to it if you would like. Uh, I definitely have room for improvement with my German as much as I like to uh, use German sources. I definitely, um, yeah, not uh, very confident in my translations, but then again, I want to show that uh, quote to kind of show what I'm getting at. And I do think that um, the there's a lot of literature and memory studies that I still need to engage with more deeply, perhaps. Uh, the sense, uh, the things that I'm arguing against are kind of broader uh, ideas that you kind of get the sense of, well, reading a bunch of things and not necessarily particular things in Aspen or uh, other people in memory studies. So I think you are correct in that I could probably find things that agree with what I'm saying in some of those foundational uh, ideas. And the things that I'm arguing against in terms of national identity and uh, all of that, or perhaps the things that were published later especially in kind of uh, national contexts about uh, Lithuania and Lithuania and uh, other places. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I will with uh, I will now use my own position of having the microphone to ask some questions to you. Well, partly also because this research is something that uh, is very close to um, what I'm doing. Um, but in the meantime, I also encourage uh, other attendees to uh, type other questions and more questions into the Q&A uh, function, Q&A uh, window. So, uh, Gunde, fascinating talk. Uh, a lot of uh, 
things to think about. And I have, I mean, I could ask 10 questions without even writing them down. But the first one I, I'm really curious about is this transculturation thing. Um, so what, what do you think transculturation gives you? Or what is the benefit of transculturation as a lens or as a, as a framework in uncovering the uniqueness or the importance or significance of the material that you have at hand? And the material is incredibly diverse and there's a huge range of, of things, you know, and even within one linguistic group, for example, Japanese, there is so much that you could, you could eat for pretty much anything because also by the sheer number of these people, you know, you could just say, well, this, they just represent Japan because they're just half a million. So what does this transcultural um, framework provide you with in analyzing all of that very abundant material? Um, right. Well, first of all, uh, about the thing you said that it could, you could say that it represents Japan. Um, I was wondering to what extent does it represent even all the prisoners of war? Because even though it sounds like a lot, the 2000, 2000 numbers and the, if you look at the 600,000, that's less than 1% of people who actually wrote down their memoirs, even if uh, each book is written by a different person. Um, so to what extent the memoirs are actually representative of the experience uh, is I think another question um, since just numerically uh, very few people actually wrote and published their memoirs despite how much there actually are. In terms of transculturation, I think um, it allows me, first of all, to connect my skills. It allows me to use my expertise and my background uh, from the Fania and Japanese studies to kind of, to provide a new perspective, I think, on the camps. Because there are, uh, some studies that try to look beyond the nation, uh, look at Eastern Europe, for example, as a broader region and look at camp members from there or um, some sort of other different borders of equal control. But I think the transcultural lens really allows me to kind of connect um, places that are really far from one another and that would not make sense in a different project or from a different perspective. And I think it also uh, gives the benefit of seeing the camps as contact zones, as uh, places where people were uh, meeting and mixing and that was meaningful in some way. Instead of looking at the camps uh, and those experiences as they usually look at for uh, the hunger and the cold and uh, the labor and the death and all of that kind of, that is important and a lot has been said about that. And that is definitely kind of the meat of it all. But taking a transcultural perspective, I think allows me to kind of say that other things also happened. And perhaps looking at the microcosm of the camps would allow us to perhaps make uh, broader uh, conclusions about culture and uh, outside of the camps, culture in general. Although uh, that is a very <laughs> big goal and I'm not gonna try to make any broader things about culture, but focus on camps. I hope that answers uh, the question. Although I think I could think and say a lot more about this book <laughs> yes uh, it, it does answer the question uh maybe if, if we approach it from a different angle then what differences in perception or what differences in memory or mem differences in you know thinking about the whole experience or maybe trying to grasp the whole experience 
were you able to find for example between or, or are there any differences i'm not assuming there are uh, between mm -hmm. for example the japanese on one hand and lithuanians on the other uh, i think a big difference is religion uh, religion features in lithuanian memoirs a lot and uh, features very little in japanese memoirs that is a difference i was noticed also between uh, german POW memoirs and uh, japanese POW memoirs that religion is much more important um, and i think uh, the context in which these were these memoirs were produced the two contexts were quite different and they kind of bear that mark in japan they were coming out right from the start for a very long time and in Lithuania they kind of all came out at once uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, so they do bear these marks of the times that they were the times and the context that they were produced in. So I'm kind of trying to look beyond that, uh, and I think a whole separate thesis could be written about kind of the the press the moment in which they come out. Uh, those memoirs. Great. So uh, let's see if there are any more questions. Yeah, I will, again, the, use the remaining few minutes to maybe, I hope you don't mind this, to, to probe you a little bit further, because this is something, as you say, that no one has done before. And as you say, this can be a, a research that really uncovers some, some of the unknown features of, of such familiar things as Gulag, for example. So, um, you had a, a quote from Takasugi. Uh, I, I was very, uh, you know, happy to see that name because he's probably one of those most multicultural, most, you know, cosmopolitan uh, internees, someone who is very curious, someone who is not just there to survive, as many were. And again, we don't blame them. But Takasugi always was driven by this curiosity and the need to learn, the need to find out, the need to interact. He goes to schools and talks to children, you know, and he asks children, is Stalin good or not? You know, and, and the child says, no, Stalin is bad, you know, and thinking about that, this is during the time when Stalin is still alive and how dangerous that was, you know, well, doing that, first of all, for Takasugi himself. He probably would have gotten the 25 year sentence under the article 58 or for the child even more uh, the child who is a soviet citizen um i don't know if you know his other work but he's also written a book called watash no stalin taiken uh, my experiences with stalin and uh very interesting and unexpected for me uh was this um encounter that he talks about with a latvian woman not Lithuanian. So um, I, I included this in, in the paper that is under review now. It will come out uh, hopefully from Kritika. But in that in that encounter, Takasugi uh, and, and this Latvian woman find themselves on, on top of a truck, basically a lorry. And because they have to just spend the night, uh, they were all traveling and the Russians on the, on the truck, they were allowed to sleep in the camp. Whereas Takasugi was um, was a POW, so he didn't have the privilege, despite the fact that he was helping his camp um, officer. And the woman, of course, he doesn't know who she is. He assumes she's Russian. Uh, the woman was um, basically an unofficial servant of uh, the other Russian guy, the other Russian kind of official who is also traveling on business. And they talk, and the woman says, you know, it's very cold. I don't bite, you know, uh, so come closer. And they sit together and they chat and she tells her him her, her life story. So, uh, and and what I really like about that episode is Takasugi says, well, we are, we are very different. I mean, he doesn't, I don't remember exactly verbatim what he wrote there, but his, um, his messages or his summary is that we are so different. We come from completely different parts, but we are now both um 
people who've lost their state um, in the Soviet uh, wilderness, you know. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that episode and some of the episodes that you've mentioned, you know, this this exchange between the Japanese POW and the Lithuanian doctor, were there quite a few of those exchanges or like how many? Like one first thing that you think about, even someone who studied this extensively, it's very difficult to imagine that there were too many of these exchanges specifically between two these two groups, you know, Lithuanians and Japanese. Uh, are there many? Uh, and um, where where do you find them? There aren't many at all, no. Uh, when I just started out, the idea was just to focus on these encounters, but uh, there's not enough uh, to write the pieces about it. So I've kind of expanded to focus on interactions between all sorts of people who see each other as different. Um, and on the Japanese part, a lot of the time, they're just describing everyone they meet as Soviets, uh, mm. which is kind of not very specific, but then again, uh, that alone tells something in itself. Um, so there aren't many, and I think even if we expand to include all kinds of interactions, and as I said, not obvious interactions, but um, sometimes people describe the black market in their memoirs, in which all kinds of prisoners would be uh, taking place. I think Ishihara Yoshiro writes about how the Japanese were especially good at needles in the camp. Um, kind of projecting this, in a way, nationalistic perspective that the Japanese were, I think he writes that the Jap only the Japanese are the sort of people who would be making needles in camps, but that is obviously not true. Other people were also making needles, so that was kind of a necessity. Um, so even with this expanded perspective on what am I actually looking for, there's not um an abundant amount of instances an abundant amount of uh descriptions of meetings and so on because i think again people kind of testifying about these experiences they were not mostly concerned with uh they were not writing a travel diary they're writing about their camp memoirs how hungry they were and how cold it was and so on uh, that is why I am planning to read a lot to find more. And then I guess sort of extrapolate to say that these happened to many people. people some people might not necessarily tell those experiences and others might not have had these because as you mentioned with Takaski Ichiro, he is a sort of more open person. And some people were not as open to these interactions and not as open to um, meet and talk and uh, do that sort of thing. So I'm very conscious how little there is. And I'm very conscious that I'm not making any conclusions about the literature at large. If this is some sort of big thing. It's just kind of a, a strand that you can find if you zoom in. And I think it is significant. Uh, for its own right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I wish you all the best of luck in completing this uh, research. I certainly look forward to seeing it published in the future. And uh, once again, let me thank you on behalf of the CJS for your talk and for agreeing to join us at this late hour. Um, and also, if you have time, please uh, keep an eye out for the new seminars in the future and please join. We will try to get as many diverse scholars as possible uh, in Japanese studies. So thank you very much, Gunde. And thank, thank you me. very much, everybody, for joining us today. So as I said, uh, this is the last uh, webinar we are having in this semester. Our next webinar tentatively will be on the 16th of February, uh, but we will uh update everybody with the with the more specific details in the near future so as this is the last one of the year let me wish you all a very good very cheery very happy pleasant festive season 
and all the best of luck. Thank you very much. Goodbye.